Amber Bookstore sells books and other items specifically directed to the African-American community. While our subject matter is targeted, we welcome all readers and patrons with an interest in what we have to offer. Purchase your books online at www.amberbookstores.com. Visit with us when we're at the different community events in St. Louis, Missouri. Illinois, Minnesota, or wherever we are located, give us a call at 314-389-2595 or 314-604-3517. Amber Bookstore Books are also located at the Love Goddess located at 2839 Cherokee Street in St. Louis, Missouri, 63118. And also at Raheem's Beauty Shop at one one at 110 East Oak Street, Carbondale, Illinois, 62901. Some of the featured books are from the Projects to the Pyramids by Malik Ahmed. Mommy and Daddy, Do You Still Love Me Anymore? By French Air Gardner. Dancing in the Wings by Debbie Allen. Please Baby by Spike Lee and Tanya Lewis. Art of War by Sun Tzu. Stolen Legacy by George G.M. James. Cultural Genocide in the Black and African Studies Curriculum by Yosef A.A. Ben Yokan. African Holistic Health by Legla Africa. Heal Thyself for Health and Longevity by Queen of Food. How Not to Eat Pork or Life Without the Pig by Shahrazad Ali. Now into the end of Kwanzaa, get 10% off. Make sure you give us a call at 314-389-2595 or 314-604-3517. Welcome to another episode of a News You Can Use podcast. My name is French Air Gardner. I am the host and creator of the podcast, and I'm delighted to have you join us live as we um, talk to our business spotlight, Hari Ziad. I am super excited to talk to him. Um, Hari Ziad is a screenwriter the best-selling author of Black Boy Out of Time, and the editor-in-chief of Race Bader. Welcome to a News You Can Use podcast, Hari. How are you? I'm doing great. It's good to be here. I haven't seen your face in so long. It was like in St. Louis, right? It (laughs) was. Yeah, we we got to do you. um, I met you at the... um, I've been trying to think of this all night what um workshop that was that you facilitated in St. Louis was it black and it was black and something yeah I don't even remember the name of the workshop but uh, I remember that it was a great experience it was like a part of a larger conference that they were doing down there with like organizers uh, but I can't remember the name I can't either, but um, you were so nice to me, and um, I got to meet you I was, when I went to um, New York for Urban Bush Women. I was like, hey, I want to connect with my New York people, and you was like, yeah, come on, and, and then you invited me out to some slam poetry in New York, and that was uh, fun, hanging out with you and your friends. <laughs> I almost forgot all about that. So was, we met twice in person. This is really great to be able to see you again. Yes, it is. More, every time I've seen you, it's been such a light. 
<laughs> what so a I'm glad to be here. Man, likewise, it's a blessing. So tell us about yourself. Tell us who you are, where you're from, where you live, and just give us some historical background of who you are. Yeah, I am from originally Cleveland, Ohio. Um, I live in Brooklyn now, in New York. I've been in New York for like 10 years now. Um, it doesn't feel that long, but it's been a long time. Um, I came here for school. I went to NYU for undergrad doing film and TV. And I just kind of stayed here ever since. Um, and that's kind of how I got into the media, storytelling, writing world. I've uh, been doing more like journalism and stuff since. Uh, I started Race Bader after I graduated because I was like, I want to tell Blackness stories. And like, I needed to create some space for myself to be able to do that. Um, and so that's where Race Bader came from. And that's kind of how I got on this trajectory to writing the book. Um, and being here on your podcast now. That's awesome. So tell us more about Race Bader and tell us more about your book, Black Boy Out of Time. You've been killing it. I've been seeing you on social media and I'm just so proud of you and, and what the work, the work, your work has done. So congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Um, Race Bader was, like I said, I was trying to start something where I could have conversations that really got into black issues that without having to always cater to the white gaze or like other people's gazes and that's why i named it race bader um because i knew that like once you start having these conversations that's what they're gonna call you they're gonna say you're playing the race card blah blah blah, blah. and i wanted to um preclude all of that and be like okay like we're not even gonna be responding to those kinds of um pressures, those kinds of um, charges against us. We're going to just create work um, with without even responding to that kind of energy, which is kind of the basis of like a lot of my work. It's very much um, things that I've learned from Toni Morrison about like not being distracted by racism and the right games, writing to your people. And that is pretty much the root of Black Boy Out of Time as well. It's a memoir about my life growing up in Cleveland, as a Hindu, um, in a Hindu family, my mother converted to the Hare Krishna religion um, before I was born, and um, I'm also queer, and so I was talking about all of that within the context of how I've become an abolitionist, someone who's working for a world without police and, uh, and prisons, um, and it really just ties up all those ideas that I was um, bringing home on Race Bader together. Uh, into a book um, that is now out in the world. And it's very much a book for Black people. I mean, obviously, if other people can engage with it and, and resonate with it, that's great. Um, but I wrote it for us, and I hope that when people read it, they feel that love and that intention behind it. Yes. Well, we appreciate you writing the book of love and joy and, and, and um, passions from your, your, your life and your experiences super grateful about it so where do we where do we purchase your book you can buy it anywhere or where they sell books online um, so like borders.com amazon um, but i suggest obviously buying it through your local bookstore usually if you order online they can get whatever books they'll order directly through the publisher but it just benefits them more um, to request it through your library if they don't have it. Um, and if you need any direct links, you can find them on my website, on any of the my social media accounts in the bios. The, the links are there also. One of our um, oh, so listeners... <laughs> You're welcome. One of, your listener, one of the listeners says, one of the best books I've ever read. Hey. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Do you want to read us an excerpt from it? Oh, I wasn't prepared for that, but <laughs> we can do that. Okay. Um, yeah, let me see. Uh, now I'm going to be like, what am I in the mood for? Um, let me just, I'll just start with the prologue. I'll read something really short from the beginning. Okay. Um, the book starts with uh, my grandmother and um, really how I understand abolition is in relation to my mother and my grandmother and understanding how we work through interpersonal conflict together and also seeing the impact of policing on them as black women. And so um, 
the prologue is really just about that and about me reconceptualizing my relationship with my grandmother because we had a lot of um, uh, intense history until right before she passed away. Okay. Um, but yeah, I'll just jump into it. I won't read too much, but uh, it's back. Uh, the prologue is called Miss Aphrodite. Um, I used to resent the fly who has the whole world to buzz around, but stays circling my head anyway. I learned only recently that insects orbit our bodies because they are attracted to our decaying skin. They sense the parts of us that are dying that we would otherwise never notice. Perhaps in the single month they have to live, they are just trying to share in this terrifying experience together. Just saying, I am dying too, but all I ever heard was a nuisance. My grandmother, Mother Boomy, lived with my family in Cleveland Heights, Ohio, for the last four years of her life. Whenever I came home during a break from college, she would single me out to go on walks with her, no matter who else was around or capable. I still don't know why she picked me. I used to believe she was simply testing my patience. Now I wonder if, like the fly, she was being drawn to the parts of me that I had begun to lose over the years, pieces of my childhood that reflected so much of the life she would soon lose too. When my grandmother converted to Vaishnavism, she was given the name Bhumata, which is also what Hindus call the earth goddess. My mother was ca called Krishna Nandini, though she raised me to call her Mata, the Sanskrit word for mother. They both found faith in Krishna, the central god of their Hindu denomination, but Mother Bhumi who struggled with bipolar disorder my whole life, lost pieces of herself along the way. She died in 2014 of natural causes, the medical report said, but that's a lie. When black folks die, it's never so simple. When black folks die, it can always be traced to the myriad ways the state has perfected killing us over the last five centuries of colonization. The other day I had a nightmare in which Mata was chanting. Her long fingers lurched around furiously inside the cloth bag that she carries with her everywhere to hold her sacred chanting beads. The bag is stitched with the figure of Krishna, who is described in Hindu scriptures as being so black he appears blue. The figure on the bag is rendered blue as Krishna usually is, but with no trace of the black he's supposed to be. After Mata was initiated into Vaishnavism, she made a vow to repeat the mantra from which the sect gets its nickname. 27,648 names of Krishna or the names of his energies on her beads daily. I regularly witnessed this process take up hours of her day, and so it wasn't the chanting that turned the dream into a nightmare. It was the way the words spilled off her tongue like blood, like a plea, like what more can I fucking lose to this world to stop it from trying to kill me? It was that I didn't remember how to speak without my tongue being forced by the brutality of this world, so I could not form words to offer her protection from brutality. I just sat there, grasping for sentences to comfort my mother like they were the last few pockets of air in a slowly submerging room of a capsized ship. I woke up to my sweat turning adhesive between the sheets and my skin, and Mata's repeated prayers seared into my mind. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. For her 66th birthday, she had asked all 10 of her children for the same thing she requested the previous year and the year before that. I just want you to commit to chanting one round a day, one round, 1,728 names. Okay, but what do you really want? I responded with an eye roll. She knew I wasn't the praying type. Money would be nice, she relented, and so I sent her money. I still think that if Mata could wish for any one thing in the world, it would be that each of her children, who now range in age from 21 to 50, take the religion of her mother more seriously. But only a few of us were chanting regularly before the disease. She told me about her uterine cancer diagnosis just the day after that 66th birthday, at the beginning of 2018. It was spreading. I don't want you to freak out, she said over the phone in that pliant voice of hers, as warm and sweet as a mug of hot chocolate. My heart skipped as she stirred in the words, rare and aggressive. I could tell that my mother had practiced this call numerous times, and I assumed she had delivered the news to my siblings already. But as meticulously as she phrased it, underneath her carefulness, I still heard, I don't want you to be a child. The unuttered words mocked me through the filter I built policing myself, trying to get away from the little boy I had con 
been conditioned to want to leave behind. And uh, that's where I'll say for now, but... Beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> Beautiful. Yes. Thank you. That was my first time reading from the prologue. I usually read for much deeper, but... <laughs> my condolences to you. And um, I would love to ask you, what was the experience like being with a mother that had bipolar? Like, I have bipolar. I'm a, I'm a mother. Um, I'm not an active mother, but I am a mother. And so what, what was your experience like, uh, being a child raised by a mother with bipolar? Yeah, my, it was actually my grandmother. It was your grandmother. Okay. But we lived with her, we moved her into the house for, um, I think like starting when I went to high school and she was still there by the time she passed away when I was in college. Okay. Um, but, and before that, like, we were taking care of her, so we saw her all the time. Um, and the reason I start with my grandmother is because it really opened my mind ab- uh, about how easily it is to internalize, internalize the demonization of mental health issues, and particularly when it's um, associated with a black body and a black woman's body. Um, I think when I grew up, I was terrified of my grandmother. Most of the time, um, she was untreated and so she would have a lot of like mental health crises and she would lash out at my mother and so I saw a lot of things that were really traumatizing to witness and I grew up with like this fear of her and this like um almost like imagining that she deserved a lot of the responses that she received from this um there would be times when police would show up and also saw a lot of traumatizing interactions between her and the police and so it was growing up and recognizing just how unfair that was to her that i really started to see um one how this impacts us like oh oh, this these incarcerated ideas of like who deserves punishment for what Mm -hmm. is like intergenerational it's passed down and we start learning very early what that looks like um and two um like what it means for that my mother was trying so hard to deal with this without really good resources at her disposal um and still she tried very hard like my first experiences with concepts of abolition, even though I didn't name it that and no one called it that, was when my mother would deal with these um, mental health crises with her her mother and would be like, I'm not calling the police. Like, I've seen the violence that they've um, enacted and trying to resolve those things on through other means, um, trying to do whatever she could to, to make this life with her grandmother one that wasn't revolving around her being punished for her mental health illness and so um as i got older and when i was coming back from college and i was having these different experiences with her Mm -hmm. um and particularly with these walks like that was the first time i was able to see my grandmother outside of all of the things that i put on her that the world had put on her um and that was a really like just an eye-opening experience and also uh it, it because right after that is when she passed away. It was when I realized like so much of my relationship had been lost to these ideas of like who she was supposed to be as someone who struggled through this illness. Um, and so I didn't want to bring that into my other relationships. Although like my relationship with my mother isn't defined by mental illness in that way, it is still about like how we resolve conflicts with each other. And I didn't right. want it to be rooted in this idea that I punish, I have to punish her or think of her as deserving of punishment because of whatever conflicts that we have. Um, and it was really my grandmother who taught me that. Amongst many other things, she's also, you know, one of the first black people who joined this spiritual community um, of Hare Krishnas. And so just seeing how she carved out this space for her and her family, despite all of the pressures of the world, is also something I've learned a lot about uh, what kinds of spaces are possible for us to create for ourselves um, to, to dictate, to determine um, what kinds of lives we want to live um, that aren't necessarily accepted by wider society. Um, and so, yeah, it, it was a very, there's so much to growing up with my grandmother um, and growing up with my mother. Um, it's not all like uh, really 
uh, amazing memories, but it is all things that have taught me what it meant to love and what it meant to love uh, in the midst of struggle in particular. Yes. And I loved how you said that, you know, it might take a long time, but she did those those readings, you know, how she how she read for hours and in and, and practicing her religion. I mm-hmm. I love how you expressed that. And and that she wanted y'all to join in in that. You know, she yeah. wanted y'all to be a part of that with her. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that was always, my mother was very spiritual. Um, even like growing up, they were, um, they kind of went on this like spiritual journey with each other. And like they grew up in a very fundamentalist Christian background. And then they also both explore like the nation of Islam for a moment. Uh, so spirituality was always a very big part of their experience and about a very big part of how they made sense of their lives as like black women in this world and how they were able to find some sense of safety amidst all of this. Um, and so I really respect how much power that journey gave to them, even though like at the time that I the, I'm writing about here, I was like, you know, I'm not, you know, I'm not that spiritual kind of person. Um, And more recently, I've become a much more spiritual person because I've been able to see um, the aspects of that that were such an integral part of all of the wonderful things that we experienced. Whereas before, I was uh, mostly tying that spiritual experience to like all of the bad stuff we experienced. Right. Which I don't think is is fair. And it's very binary. Um, So, yeah, it was... um, it's really interesting, and I'm, I'm definitely reconceiving what my ideas about spirituality are now, um, and that's solely due to my mother and, and, and how she raised us. Yes. So um, I wrote this uh, interview series called Black Influencers Values a while back. And I basically want to get into leaders' heads, get into and find out what your inspirations and motivations are. So, describe yourself in three words. Um, three words. Um, uh... Do you want to bring balance to all the wireless radiation fields in your life, including 5G? The Omnia Radiation Balancer is a small sticker you can stick on any device. It changes the state of the field and creates a new resonance between the wireless radiation and your energy field. On the link below, you'll see all our testing results that show how the body responds excellently once you've made this change in your life. Plus, you can enter the discount code BBE in capital letters for a 10% discount. It's easy to bring balance back to your body with the Omnia Radiation Balancer. Um, Very committed to the things that I believe and that I, um, yeah, I'm, and I'm also just a uh, gray is the other word. Like I like to live in the space between the black and whites um, and, and I honor ambiguity. And um, I think that's a big part of who I am too. So I don't know, those are more than three words. But <laughs> Better words. <laughs> Ideas, I would say. That yes. Comes to mind. <laughs> what was that fleeting moment in your life that catapulted you to your present self, but certainly could have really gone the other way? Um. Yeah, a big part of who I am now is um, how my mother responded to me telling her that I was queer, um, which was not very good. Spoiler. Um, and that's kind of like the basis of the book is reconciling our relationship. And I think for a long time, like I was saying, I um, used that moment and used that very real pain um, and very real um, betrayal to um, reject so much about her and about um, what are all of the things that I associated with her. Um, and that defined me for a very long time. It's like, I define myself by not being like my my family and my parents. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think it's taken a shift now because of what we were just talking about. It's like, if I could have stayed on that path and 
um, been very resentful and, and continue to look at that through a very, uh, you know, uh, not very nuanced lens. Um, and it's recently where I've been able to see that as one part of a whole figure of who my mother was, where there were so many loving aspects of her, um, even amidst the, the tension that we had around my gender and sexuality, um, that are part of her too. And um, being able to recognize that and see her as a whole person um, is it's definitely a, a shift in that path that could have taken me to uh, somewhere that wouldn't have been very healthy for me, I don't think. Um, it definitely wouldn't have been healthy for our relationship mm-hmm. together. What are your morning and nightly rituals? Um, they're all messed up now because I'm like super stressed and trying to uh, just make it through the day most times. But uh, I used to, and I'm trying to get back into um, reading before bed. That's like a really amazing practice that's also super calming and has been really helpful uh, for my uh, rest. Um, I also try to um, go to the altar in the morning, give my mother, my grandmother some water and start my day off that way. Um, And that is also something that I've been struggling with a lot more recently. But those are the rituals that I would like to continue to to have. Um, And usually when I am doing those rituals, um, my day is much better. So... It's really weird because you're like, I'm so stressed out. I, I can't even think about doing the things that will help me not be stressed out. And it becomes like this cycle. Um, yeah. But yeah, I'm trying to get back on on the, the wheel with those things. We gonna get back there. <laughs> Who should I interview next? Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, you met my partner at the... Um, poetry slam that I brought you with who's also a really amazing writer Timothy Dwight and um, playwright Uh, if you're looking for more artists um, to speak to uh, my friend Blair runs this company called Blairisms I don't know if you're familiar with that um, but it seems like aligned with you highlighting um, businesses um, and black businesses in particular um, there are some amazing people in this audience. Portia is a great writer um, as well, if you want to reach out to them. Um, but yeah, I know so many writers and artists and, and poets. Um, if you want me to send you some more suggestions afterwards, I can do that too. That would be great. Uh-oh, I messed up. Oh, there we go. Who is your target audience and your self-proclaimed niche talents and our gifts? Um, so my target audience is black people. More specifically, I'm interested in reaching um, black people who um, might not have, um, who are looking for um, someone to affirm the possibility of what kinds of worlds are available to us. Um, it's basically like me a couple of years ago. I write for myself where when when I was struggling through a lot of these things and like what I needed to hear. Um, and I know that there are lots of other people who, who need to hear those same things. Um, I want to give uh, black folks and black queer people um, the t- more um, strength in the belief that we can create worlds where we are fully free and fully liberated and where um, we could have had full access to our childhoods and live them out. Um, and because I totally believe that that's possible. And so I'm writing to, to just uh, bring other people um, and myself when that belief wavers um, into the fold of knowing that that's something that we need and, and something that we can always be working towards. And Most what was the definitely. second part of the question? The second part was, uh, what are your self-proclaimed niche talents and our gifts? Um, like things that people might not know about or just in general? In general. Oh, I mean, yeah, I'm a writer, so like that and a storyteller. Um, hopefully you'll see more of me writing for the screen and writing fiction. 
Uh, honestly, like when I started doing more of this nonfiction and journalism stuff, like that was never really where my like, passion lied necessarily. Okay. Um, although I, I love to do it and like, the, I think it's very related to the types of worlds that I want to create in fiction. Um, but so you'll uh, hopefully see more of that in, for me in the future. I also draw um, and not as much as I should, um, or not as much as I used to, and it's not something that I want to create a, uh, make a, like, a money-making thing out of. It's just a hobby, so I do a little drawing and painting on the side. Um, yeah, I think those are the, the main things. Nice. I love to paint, too. Oh, that's... I knew we had more things in common. Yeah. <laughs> What did the younger you envision, see, think, or was told to make you impact people the way you do? What did the younger me envision? What was the... Say that one more time. I will. Okay. What did the younger you envision, see, think, or was told to make you impact people the way you do? Um, that's actually what the whole book is about. So the book is about um, me trying to get back to that space where I'm in tune with what the younger me would have desired, would have wanted, would have envisioned. Um, so half of the book is written in self epistolary form to my younger self um, for that very purpose. Wow. And um, I think that the younger me would have said those same things. Like the younger me had this idea of what was possible um, and had this idea of like not needing to constrain myself and contain myself just for the sake of the world. And so I think the younger me is always trying to remind me. Um, I do a lot of inner child work too. And so one of the, a lot of the messages that I get when I'm doing that is reminders that like I don't have to break myself and make myself smaller for the sake of existing in the world, uh, especially at the detriment of the uh, freedom that my soul is calling out for. And so um, I think that that is what the world that my younger self envisioned for me is what, uh, a world where I didn't have to do that so constantly. Yes. What is your favorite book, song, and quote, and why? Um, favorite book. I don't know about favorite books. I think my favorite author is Toni Morrison, um, just because of, I mean, it's in terms of um, the skill and, like, being one of the best with words, uh, but also her vision of, like, what it meant to write for Black people and to Black people and what was possible for that kind of work is really, like, at the heart of the work that I love to do and that resonates with me as well. Um, my favorite song... Um, I don't know if I have a favorite song. My fa one of the songs that I'm loving right now is a song called All Night by Bree Runway. It's this like, uh, black British um, pop slash hip hop artist who I'm like obsessed with right now. And um, that's the song that I constantly bring back on repeat. And what was the last one? Favorite quote. Favorite quote. Um, I don't know. I don't think I have a favorite quote. I have a quote tattooed on me from um, a Hindu scripture. It's, okay. Uh, give up this weakness of heart and arise. Um, oh, chastise the demons. Do not fear. I will protect you. And if, for me, it's just a reminder of, you know, the, the lineage of people, my ancestors who are here to protect me when I am fighting for the things that I believe um, I don't know if it's my favorite quote, but it's a quote that has been very meaningful to me and it has reminded me of what I'm capable of, uh, reminded me of the importance of fighting um, when it has felt easier to just give up. Mm. Um, and uh, like I said, reminded me of who's behind me and what kinds of protections are over me. I love that. Now tell me, you said, what was the band name for um, Who Sings All Night? Oh, Brie Runway. It's just uh, one person, a, a, a woman. Spell it. Brie, B-R-E-E, -E, and then Runway, R-U-N-W-A-Y. Thank you. She's, 
I mean, if that's if that's your type of thing, she's amazing. She's very much like um, she's very much influenced by like Missy and like bringing hip hop to like pop sensibilities. Um, and I just love it. She's like this just wacky kind of out there personality, um, and I love her. <laughs> I'm gonna check her out for sure. <laughs> Name two things you want to tell the world. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I'm not usually talking to the world as a whole. Um, I am, I think you lose a lot of what can be useful when you get that broad. Um, in terms of like what kind, what people could actually take in and sink into. One thing that I want to leave to Black people is to um, start doing their ancestor work. Um, that's like my mission for this year. I've just become an evangelist about altar work and set up your altar, talk to your people, recognize where you are in this lineage of people who've been doing this work forever. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. Um, we can build on um, this amazing foundation of, of really profound work and knowledge that have been built in our families for generations. And um, it will also help you with grieving and, and, and uh, a lot of the other things that you're, you're dealing with. So that's one of the things I want to leave with Black people in particular. Um, and another thing is... Um, I don't know. I, I have to come back to the second one. Okay. But that was a good reminder to me, though, because um, I definitely need to start, need to set up my altar. So thank you for that. That was a good reminder, and I needed to hear that. Yeah, and if you, and this is also for anyone in the audience, if they, you have questions about what that entails, like you can always reach out to me. I'm not an expert on any of it. I'm not like a priest or a priestess in hoodoo, but um, I can also point to the right directions if you want to dig deeper. Um, and yeah, I'm happy to, like I said, I'm, this is part of where I want to be is, is telling people how to do this or, or encouraging people how to do, uh, towards doing this. So definitely reach out to me. I sure will. Are you a saver or a shopper? And what are your stra financial strategies? <laughs> um, I think it changes. Like, it's it's not always one thing. Um, when it comes to certain things, um, when it comes to, like, experiences, I try to give myself more leeway to just, you know, invest in those things, trips, invest in going to see shows with people I love. Um, I don't really buy a lot of clothes and things like that. Um, and I don't know if that's like part of a coherent financial strategy as much as it's just what has made the most sense for me right now. Um, only strategy that I um, can vouch for and, 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 and encourage people to do is, especially if you have your own work that you're doing, is to start an LLC and to um, get someone who can help you with your taxes depending on how much money you're bringing in through that um, because when I was doing my own taxes after starting race later and freelancing uh, and then when I switched over to someone who was helping me a black woman uh, it was like night and day in terms of what I was paying so um, yeah that's the only thing that uh, I don't, I'm not like super smart about money unfortunately I'm trying to get better we all are does and uh when you have something that's super important to you, what do you tell yourself to get pumped? Um, when I have something that's really important to me, that's when I usually go to my altar and I talk to my people and light a candle and just receive whatever energy that they're gonna give me. Um, and yeah, I, I think the messages that come in are sometimes different, but it's always what I need at the time. 
Um, and that's how I prepare. Uh, mostly what it does is I struggle with anxiety, so it also helps to calm me and center me um, and helps me to focus on the things that I know that I have to bring to whatever that event is, um, which is really important and just as important as getting out of death, I guess, for me. Yes. Name five people that you know that embody or know or don't know that embody instrumental traits sh children should emulate. Um, yeah, I mean, the, mo the main people that I'm thinking about are like people like my mother for all the reasons that we've talked about before and my grandmother. Um, I don't know if I would encourage children to emulate anyone, especially adults. Um, I think they can learn from people who paved the way um, before them without trying to um, emulate them. Like to me, okay. emulate means like shaping yourself into something that someone right. else is rather than, you know, using what they shaped as part of your tool to shape yourself. Um, and I think that, you know, anyone who's doing work that centers black people, anyone that is doing that work that creates more possibility for the worlds that we can exist in, um, anyone who's like really committed to abolition work, a world where we can, can resolve conflict without punishment, uh, are people that I would hope that um, children can can learn some lessons from and and be protected by mainly because i think um children will teach us more things around that than we can teach them well <laughs> that's the truth all right what is your what is your website and your business name um my website is harizia.com it's my first and last name and then for race bather, it's just race bather without an e before the final r dot com. Um, race bather is a publication where we publish other black writers around issues um, dealing with abolition. And um, what was the? I keep my brain is like not retaining log. You're <laughs> fine. Of information. You're, what was the second part of the question? You're fine. You basically <laughs> answered it. <laughs> What's your business name? <laughs> Oh, Race Bader is my company's name. Um, yeah. <laughs> how do we get in contact with you? Um, how do we stay stay contact with you socially? Yeah, I'm on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. Um, not super often on Facebook anymore, um, but you can always reach out. Um, it's all Harry's yet on all of those social media accounts. And then you can also send me an email through my uh, website, harryzia.com. Excellent. Any upcoming projects that we need to know about? Any of that new exciting news? Not yet. There are some things in the works that hopefully can be announced soon. But as of now, it's just, you know, praying and manifesting those things into existence. Yes, I shaded that. So, our last segment, Hari, is mining for diamonds. And I ask that you drop two more gems. You dropped so many beautiful gems already. But drop two more gems for aspiring um, entrepreneurs or business owners. Um, you know, what would you, what would you say to them? Yeah, I think the main thing that I hope that my career trajectory shows um, is that you can write for us and be very intentional about the work that you do for Black people um, and still be successful. Like, you don't have to compromise that part of yourself. Um, it's much easier to, like, if you, if you want to do it that way. But if you really are, like, you don't have to give up your hopes of writing books that reach lots of people and writing for TV um, if you are centering Black people um, or centering queer people or centering any marginalized community that um, we're told are universal. Um, and so I, I just really hope that people are able to see that in everything that I do. 
um, and to receive that inspiration when they're considering, you know, compromising themselves in order to, to be more palatable. Yes. Thank you so much. It's been great talking to you, Ari. Thank you. This was amazing. Yes, it was. So let me let me shout out to uh, everybody that uh, joined us on the live. We thank uh, everybody that joined us on live. We, we got a crowd today. So I want to say um, peace and blessings and thank you to my sorority sister, Yakima Davis, um, Wumsy African Attire, STL. Let's see who else we got. Sneak Way. Dot Stephanie. Huffle Puppers. Unlimited Creations for You. Hey Joe. Who's that? Hey Jose Alfredo. Muscle Girl 319. Curate. Black. Chef My Team. Sneaky B69, Kevy, thank you, Brando, Nick. It's, it's Mara Stern. Parenting is political. Thank you guys for tuning in. A Bell Book, Dancing, what a minute, Dancing Hathor. Lively Stone, Peace Brother, Diego Cheeks, thank you to Black Dot United Nations, Intimate Connections tuned in, thank you. Black Cannon Radio um, says that he want to have you on his radio show, on their radio show. Yeah, reach out. Portia, Portia Lawyawa, Walla. I'm not pronouncing that right, but thank you for tuning in. Golden Seahorse, Wooden Vibe Studio, Clax 10, The Black Scholar joined us. Thank you, Port Lock Banks, Ella Reed. Thank you to Marcus Greeno, CJ Harden, Naomi S. Sherell. Thank you to Celeste. Celestial Flute. Schoolboy Hugh showed up for us. Thank you. Sahil.me. Thank you, Johnny JG. And Jalon. Who else we got here? W underscore Illy. Impression 99. Justin Ryder 7. Blue Mood. Am uh, amazing. No. Amana Zoranet. Reggie's Reads says Harry's book is making an impact. Celestial Flute says one of the best books I ever have read. That's awesome. Thank you to Grodon for showing up. Diego San Diego 43, Trappy Hour, Harlem Reloaded joined us. Little Michigan, Stefan JB, Sarah Love 28. Bliss Monica. We had a lot of people to join us. It was awesome. Uh, Jay Lamar Music. Sparkle Motion Bar. No, Sparkle Motion. Sparkle Emotion Bear. Uh, Core.ece. Uh, thank you to MJS Beauty Spot Shop. Thank you to Hey Miss Joseph. Comedy Cures. JC. Yuhata. Fox 38, Victoria Arturian. So I want to thank all of you guys for tuning in to the live. Thank you, Hari, for tuning in with me. And um, it's been a blessing. So we'll be, um, stay tuned. The episode will go on live onto um, streaming onto Spotify and Apple Podcasts and all of that. And so we'll send you the link once it's uh, live. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for having me. You're awesome. And go get the book. Tell us it one more time where to get your book. You can find a link on my website, arizian.com, or just order wherever you get books online. Awesome. All right. Well, we'll talk to y'all again. Thank you again. Peace and blessings. <laughs> Take care. Have a good rest of your week. You too. Peace.
Thank you so much to all of our financial supporters of A News You Can Use podcast. I ask that you consider buying me a coffee or becoming a patron of A News You Can Use podcast. Um, What your support does is it helps me to continue to make, produce and publish episodes, and it's helping me to level up, um, to buy equipment for the podcast, like microphones and um, different software that is needed to edit the podcast and make it sound better for you. So I appreciate appreciate it if you please buy me a coffee. Or become a patron. Or you can donate directly through the Anchor FM app. And if you um, give $9.99 per month, I'll receive a higher percentage of your donation. I really appreciate you. Thank you. The links are in the show notes. Peace and blessings. Please make me die a thousand deaths in a day, and then I won't jump in the front while you put it down for the time. Put it down for the time. I saw my Peace. Shalom, shalom. Hotel. Yeah, MIDT records. Top. BB Productions. Hot top. Rhythmic sign. Love to rap. Yo, check it out. All your local neighborhood stories. Thank you so much for tuning in to another episode of a News You Can Use podcast with Frontier Gardner, your host and creator of the podcast. We are so grateful that you are tuning in wherever you are in the world. Please, please, please make sure you are sharing the podcast with your friends and family. At least send it out to about five people at least. Follow us if you're listening to us on Spotify so that you'll be notified of the next episodes. Add us to your um, podcast list on Apple Podcasts and leave us a review. Leaving us a review really helps us out a lot. It helps us to be discovered by more people like you where this information resonates. Purchase French Air Gardener's books. <laughs> Mommy and Daddy, Do You Still Love Me Anymore? is available on, on paperback. And ebook on Amazon. For signed copies, go to our website. Finding Joy in the Journey Volume 2 is available on our website. And the audiobook, Single Save Struggle, The Struggle Continues, is available on our website. You can also purchase our brands that we've designed with our paintings on our websites, notebooks, shower curtains,
prints of the paintings. Pillows, buttons, phone case for iPhones and, and Android phones, handbags, or rather tote bags, all designed with Frenchair's abstract paintings. They are available on Threadless and Teespring. The list, the music playing in the background is by Frontier Gardner. You can cop her album or just get one of the singles that you really enjoy on Amazon Music and Apple Music. You can also listen to the album Supernova Universe by Frontier Gardner on Spotify and SoundCloud. We really appreciate your support. Your financial donations are definitely needed to sustain production of the episodes and the podcast, continue creating episodes. For purchasing equipment that's needed to run the podcast, to hire editors. So, if this episode resonated with you, please consider donating by becoming a patron, by buying me a coffee, by sending us funds through PayPal, paypal paypal.me forward slash Frenchair, that's F-R-E-N-C-H-A-I-R-E, or through Cash App, dollar sign B-E-A-N-D-U-S, LLC. Thank you so much for tuning in. Make sure that you... Tap in with our sponsors, Amber Bookstore and Omnia Balance Radiation. Uh, yeah, 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 My brown skin, like Coco. Got him going loco. She wanna bounce on my pogo. I'm like, oh no, my heart cold like Froyo. We won't get no promo. We just kick it like a dojo. I'm like, yeah, I love my brown skin, like Coco. Got him going loco. She wanna bounce on my pogo. I'm like, oh no, my heart cold like Froyo. We won't get no promo. We just kick it like a dojo. Ain't gon' lie, there's a million reasons why I can't choose the other side Cause that cocoa skin so fire If you think a nigga lying For yourself you should try Swear that beauty be so fire Different shades that get your eye Make you say this shit ain't right Make you wanna wipe your eye Make you wanna spend the night Make you wanna take that flight Tell them hoes to take a hike Cause that booty hit like Mike Swear that booty feel like life Grip feel like the jaws are light Like a kid I slip and slide Ain't no reason to go high Off the Addy we we gon' fight, anime, anime, I'm your eye. Ain't no reason to go high. Off the eddy, we gon' fight. Anime, anime, I'm your eye. I'm like, yeah, I love my brown skin. Like Coco, got him going loco. She wanna bounce on my pogo. I'm like, oh no, my heart cold like Froyo. We won't get no promo, we just kick it like a dojo. I'm like, yeah, I love my brown skin. Like Coco, got him going loco. She wanna bounce on my pogo. I'm like, oh no, my heart cold like Froyo. You won't get no promo, we just kick it like a dojo. 